to consider compressible effects, especially in flow, in nozzles, and diffusers. Beyond that, it's too much. Just get, can we, can we talk about flow and nozzles and diffusers, both for, for subsonic as well as supersonic flow? So review subsonic, and this is a hard set of questions, but think about this. I have a nozzle, right? Here's a sketch of it. I'm going to consider its reversible flow. Entropy is constant. I have no irreversibilities in the flow through the nozzle. That's very, very common. Likewise, a diffuser, but let's get the nozzle down first. And tell me, how is the area of the inlet related to the area of the exit? This is the easiest of the questions up here. Is it that way? Is that the relationship? A1 is greater than A2? Good. Now, what about V? How does the V change from inlet to outlet? For a subsonic nozzle, as I've shown, where the cross-sectional area is getting smaller. Is the velocity go up? Is it that way? Good. How about the kinetic energy? Is the kinetic energy of the flow the same in to out? Does it go up or does it go down? It goes up. So it's like this. And what information did you use to discern that? The kinetic energy is one half V squared. And if V squared, V went up, V squared went up, true? Now, what about the enthalpy? Somebody would say they're equal, which is a common answer. So you want to do an energy balance. And when you do an energy balance around that nozzle, you find the inlet enthalpy plus the inlet kinetic energy must equal the exit enthalpy plus the exit kinetic energy. Do people follow that line of thought? So now, which way is it? H1 is greater because H1 plus Ke1 must be equal to H2 plus Ke2. True? And this is larger than this. So this is smaller. This was smaller. This is larger. How's that? To make it still equal. Is this correct? Yes. Temperature. Well, what principle do we use? We know that there is a property. When we talk about ideal gases, and this I forgot to say is an ideal gas, then H is only a function of temperature only. Enthalpy is only a function of temperature. Higher temperature, higher enthalpy. Lower temperature, lower enthalpy. Can I turn it around? Yes, you could say higher enthalpy, higher temperature. Lower enthalpy, lower temperature. Is that right? Yeah. How about pressure? Stays the same. Goes up, goes down. Go down, so is it this way? How do we prove it to a skeptic? How do we prove it to ourselves? We remember for an ideal gas, S is equal to a constant. Instead of PV to the K is equal to a constant, true. You have that other relationship, which, uh, boy, let me quickly turn to it so I don't write it down wrong. That you have, let's say this one, that um, P2 divided by P1 is equal to T2 over T1 to the power K over K minus 1. S is equal to a constant. Temperature and pressure are related. I think I have it right. Yeah. So, but what happens now? Can you tell? Is the pressure at 2 greater than the pressure at 1? Or is the pressure at 2 less than the pressure at 1? Less. Good. How about the density? Well, the density goes down, so it's like this. Right? Lower pressure, lower temperature, density is going to change too. Okay, let's do this. Switch to a diffuser. Play the same game. Okay, I'm going to consider an ideal gas flow through a diffuser. It's reversible flow, so it's isentropic. I say, what happens to the area? What happens to the speed? True? All of that. Now, when they say a diffuser, what do you expect it to do? It's 
the, the nozzle, a lot of people think about it as this. It speeds the flow up. True. Speeds the flow up. What does a diffuser do? Slows the flow down. True. All of this is for a subsonic case. Somebody says supersonic. Did you know that a supersonic diffuser, something that's going to make the flow do what? Speed up or slow down? A diffuser. Flow, slow down will look like this. It will be the area is getting smaller. Hold it. That's just opposite of the subsonic. That's exactly right. It is just the opposite of the subsonic. And so when you go to supersonic flow, the diffuser cross-section area, cross area gets smaller. Okay? So we still have, well, we switch it. So the V, maybe I should have put the nozzle on the, on the left side and the diffuser on the right to be consistent. But you go through the same type of questions here. But before we answer them, let's see how is this even possible. Well, there's a little bit of a derivation. And after the derivation, you're left with this landmark equation. This equation's in the box at the top. So let's take a look at this box at the top. It says it's a relationship of how changes in cross-sectional area affect the change in the velocity or speed for flow, one-dimensional flow. And notice that this term in parentheses is 1 minus m squared. What is that m? Mach number. When it's equal to 1, it's, it's sonic flow. If it's greater than 1, supersonic. Take a look at what happens to the sign in this term that I just underlined. If m is less than 1, subsonic flow. That's our first case. Then, then that 1 minus 0.3 squared is is a positive entity. So if that's positive, then I see that if the area decreases, the speed increases, that negative sign has to be taken into account. All right. If Mach is greater than 1, this term right here is what? 1 minus 1.5 squared? It's a negative. It switches the sign such that if the area goes up, the speed goes up. So if it's supersonic, if it's supersonic and you're flowing into a region of increasing area, whoops, it's like this, the speed goes up. It's a nozzle. It accelerates the flow. It's completely contradictory to your first sense, right? But that's, that's the truth. So where does this equation come from now that we see how useful it is? We'd like to see it der derived, okay? Well, what you do is you uh, start out and you have the mass flow rates constant through the device. So m dot's equal to rho AV. You go back to calculus where you say a change in m dot's equal to a change in rho and a change in A and a change in V. That's calculus for uh, like chain rule. And then you rearrange, and then you go to the energy equation. You say, you know what? H plus one half B squared. Even if V is changing, A H will change, but the sum of the enthalpy and kinetic energy will be constant. You can do the little calculus on that too. You go and find a property relation, a temperature entropy property relation. Say it's going to be isentropic flow throughout. So now I take one, two, three terms. I bring it to eliminate dH. I go to a, use a state principle where I express pressure as a function of density and entropy only. A little calculus. I say, hey, I have isentropic process. Scratch that term. So now I have dP is equal to C d rho, C squared d rho. This is very, very similar to uh, the, the, the definition of C. It is the same. All those steps are the same. They may look a little different. So you have put it together here, and then you manipulate, bring in this result, and you get, after a little bit of algebra, in following the roadmap laid out in the textbook, you find that you were able to reestablish 
this equation. But before you get bogged down in the derivation, make sure you can apply it. So when the Mach number is greater than 1, increasing area is a nozzle for a supersonic nozzle. It makes it go faster. Well, not, that's not the only nozzle equation, this one, which we just saw. We also have talk about stagnation enthalpy, and that'll, that'll be a symbol H naught. Well, what is a stagnation enthalpy? Well, this term H plus kinetic energy was constant throughout. It's equal to the value as if you brought that flow isentropically to rest, and that would be the enthalpy with no kinetic energy. Stagnation enthalpy. See the term stagnation brought to rest? Brought to rest enthalpy. If you do bring it to rest, you'll have a corresponding temperature, the stagnation temperature, which will be higher <coughs> than the other, the, the, the nominal temperature at, the, at that point when it's flowing with speed V. And so you can relate the stagnation temperature to the actual temperature through this equation. Guess what? I have it on the next slide. It's like the previous derivation. It's a lot of work. And you have the concept of stagnation pressure. So if I bring that flow isentropically to rest, temperature will go up and the pressure will go up. It'll go up to its stagnation pressure, and this is the relationship. So it depends on how fast it is. Does this equation work if Mach number is 0.2 below, below 1? It does. Does it work if the Mach number is 2? It's supersonic? It does. It works for all of those cases, okay? So these equation, this equation worked with Mach number from 0 all the way up, you know, above 1. Same here for this equation and this equation. Here's the derivation. In the interest of time, it's in the book. Is that okay? Here's the derivation. In the interest of time, is it okay? It's in the book. But the concept, what is the concept? It's stagnation. You have to bring it isentropically to rest. Stagnation temperature will be greater than the actual temperature, and the stagnation pressure, P naught, will be greater than the pressure. P, 